Press. Okay. And then this one. All right, so I think we're good again. Okay. All right, so we're gonna uh, continue running. Uh, so we've got the exponentials. Like I said, uh, I did lose the equation. Uh, so we'll have to draw that equation again, but um, we'll do that in a sec. So let's finish the, co <laughs> the code here. Uh, we're raising all the values to the, this exponential, basically. Now we can do the sum of them. So I can do sum of exponentials. Sum of exponentials. So that's just uh, the sum function of whatever is in EXPS, right? So this one over here. So let, let's run this again, just in case it broke. I'm going to do logits. I'm going to do, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do print logits here. So we can see the, how it changes, right? So I'm going to do this one. Got my values. You see that, guys? I got the values. Uh, then I'm going to print out exponentials. So actually, I should have been doing this. Uh, if you look, what I did is I grabbed two, and it's just e to the two. And then another one is e to the one, right? e to the one, by definition, is 2.7, right? Something we learn at some point, right? You know, what is e? 2.7, all right? And then the last one, um, e to the point one, and, and now you have these rates, right? Then we add them up and we get sum of exponentials. And so I'm gonna do run here and they add up to this and this becomes the denominator of my function. And then I need to apply this to the whole vector of values so that they now, these values that are here look like probabilities and add up to one. All right, so that's what I'm gonna do over here. And this is called the softmax. So I'm going to do softmax. And then I'm going to lose, uh, use, again, a list comprehension. So I'm going to say 4j in exponentials, right? So I got my 4j in exponentials. So for each one, which is j, I'm going to say j divided by sum of exponentials. So, and then I'm just gonna print softmax. And there you go. You see that? Now I can sum all of these, right? So I'm gonna do sum, uh, let's call it total prob, which should add up to one. So I'm gonna do sum of softmax, right? And I'm gonna print total from okay, I run it and it adds up to one. Does this make sense, guys? And if I, like I said, should you have known this before somehow? No, right? It's just a mechanism that machine learning uses very effectively. Okay, the that we get to get the probabilities here and they add up to one. Now it's very easy to know which class to select, right? Which class do we select here? First one. At 0.65. Now, is that model very um, confident that it that that's class one? No, because you can interpret it as it's got a 66 percent act, uh, you know, confidence that it's class the first class. You see that that's kind of the interpretation that you can take a look at there. Any questions about this idea, guys? And I don't know why it keeps doing this, right? Do you see that? No idea. But it's not doing it in the Zoom because if you look at the video from last week, it wasn't there. So it's I think it's something in the, um, the projector. No, I'm just saying, if you look at the video, I don't know if you had a chance for the video. I, I looked, there was none of this. Yeah, so then I think it's the projector that's making this. I don't know how. All right, so since I lost the, the drawing, let, let's just kind of do it again. Just that equation. Just now you know how it is. And 
was the softmax function. So, so this is one common thing in machine learning, right? The equations look, you know, wild and brutal and everything. And then you look at the code and you're like, oh, it's just that, you know? So it's, it's a lot, a lot of the time is, is more straightforward to see it in the, in the code. All right, so the function was, if you remember, it was yi, because it's every element in the vector, right? That's why it's yi. And then to the e of z i, right, for the individual one. And then this is just the sum of all three. That's why they use j, e, c, j, right? So that is the equation that we just wrote in uh, number, okay? So basically this is just a denominator and then for each one, and this results in a vector. If we have three, <laughs> then a vector of three elements. Any questions? Believe it or not, that's kind of neural networks. That's it. And that, you know, in terms of architecture, that that's it. Hopefully that makes sense to you. There's another function though, right? This is the inference function. The function gets an input, predicts an output. There's a second important function called the loss function. We're not going to cover that today. Uh, and the loss function is the function that you use to tell it how to learn the weights. Okay. It's a little, you think of it as a game between two agents or two people. One is trying to infer and the other one is telling it, you're doing a good job. You're doing a bad job. You're doing, you know, so these two are playing and they're just two functions. Okay. One is the inference function, this and then there's the loss function. We will leave that for another day. All right, so now uh, in, in the second half of today, let's just now uh, talk about the, um, uh, the classic XOR example. So if you remember, remember, I motivated initially that we can't really um, build a linear classifier, right? Um, to separate data, the XOR data, we can only do a neural network. So this is where neural networks, it's like, imagine at some point, I think this actually happened because this goes back to the history, right? There's been a lot of very arrogant people in, uh, in this field, right? Who, you know, look down on neural networks actually. And they would say, no, 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 you can't solve, you can solve this, but solve this. And they gave somebody XOR, and they were, they were stumped. They couldn't solve it. And then neural networks came around and then they could solve it, right? So that, that's kind of how it's been. It's been a series of challenges of you can't do this. And then by the way, hey, here, here's the solution. So let, we're actually gonna see this uh, quite nicely. So let, let's go ahead and um, just do the classic tensor problem. Uh, yeah, the classic XOR problem. All right, so we may not finish this one today because it is a bit big. But actually pay attention to this because we're implementing this in TensorFlow. And really, this is exactly what you would do for any other problem, okay? Any other problem. I already installed all the libraries. Um, so, you know, because this thing always deletes everything. So I'm using my laptop now. Um, so I'll just give you the libraries and give you time to install it, but I already, I already have everything. So. Let's go ahead and stop sharing here. And now we're gonna switch back to sharing code. So we can go over here. So we don't need this Jupyter anymore. Um, so let me stop here. All right, and we're gonna create a new one, Python 3. And this one you should rename probably. Uh, so this is your, yeah, I'll just call it the classic XOR. Rename. Sick. XOR. Uh, it. All right. So let's start. So this is, uh, you're gonna need uh, TensorFlow for this. So import TensorFlow, it's TF. And we're also gonna need a, a, a few other libraries. Um, so I already have this also on GitHub. 
So let me, give me a sec here. So I'll just copy some parts. All right, so as you know, it's in the course websites or course uh, repo. So you just go to neural nets, uh, TensorFlow, and then the classic XOR problem. So it's right there, but we're gonna run it, run through it. Just don't wanna copy or have to type everything. All right, so I guess let's start here. The libraries that you will need for this one, probably, um, or just in general, it's good to have these. Right, so pip install scikit-learn, if you haven't done so already for this environment, pip install TensorFlow datasets, that's a good one uh, to have the datasets and matplotlib. We're gonna try to use matplotlib quite a bit. It's it's very useful to visualize things, okay? So go ahead and run these three if you don't have them already for your environment. I already have them, so not gonna run. Make sense? All right, so now the next step is the libraries. So the libraries are these. Just copy them. Okay, so basically uh, NumPy, and then uh, these are some of the layers that you, you will use. I, I, I have more than I need, but sequential we've already seen, right? Remember, this is what allows you to link layers, input layers, hidden layers, output layers, right? So you use sequential. I think we already used the dense layer. And I already explained that that's when you have everything uh, fully connected, right? All the neurons are connected to all the neurons. There's a technique called dropout and dropout actually allows you to say, okay, I wanna have a dropout of 50, 50%. So what does that do? Instead of having all the neurons connected, only 50% of them are gonna be connected. You see that? But randomly, you don't know. So every iteration that you're running the epics is doing a different dropout. Why is that nice? Because it's it's almost like trying different architectures, but automatic. Instead of you defining this architecture, then this other architecture, then you know you do that. But we don't need that yet. So in this example, it just dense is fine. The metrics we can use the metrics from SK Learn as we know them. TensorFlow data sets if we need it, and then matplotlib pyplot as plt so that we can uh, print our plots. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that one. All right, it finished, all right, good. So now I'm gonna copy, this is a type of an initialization, it's just so that since I'm using some randomization to generate data, I'm gonna set these. All right, so TF, tensor, so like I said, oftentimes NumPy and TensorFlow are kind of similar and consistent, you can see here. We can set the random for the randomization mechanism. We can set the seed for TensorFlow, and then we can also set the the, the seed for NumPy. Notice they almost have the same syntax, but not quite the same. All right. So we're gonna run this. Oh, okay. That's not good. All right, it works now. Maybe I forgot to run. All right, now that we've done this, the next step is to generate 
some data, okay? In this case, we're gonna generate data because we wanna do the XOR problem. The XOR problem, uh, we're gonna have some value, it's basically minus one and one, right? So some values are negative, some values are positive, right? So we're gonna need to generate this data first. And then we're gonna say in what, in what section they fall in. Uh, this actually, this is probably something we should do on the white. So let's go back to the whiteboard. So we're gonna do, to simulate XOR, to simulate XOR, if you remember, right? I said that XOR was Guys, so there is no line that achieves perfect accuracy on this one, correct? Guys, there's no line, okay? So to simulate this data, what I can do is I can just take the Cartesian plane and then basically this is minus one, plus one, plus one, mi minus one, right? So then, you know, they fall on different, they're negative and positive. So this is negative and negative. Uh, negative and positive, positive and positive. What is this one? Negative and positive? Yeah. So you see, you see how that works? So I'm just going to generate random numbers within this range. Minus one and plus one. Okay. And then we're going to, they're basically a, uh, like this. So going to generate two numbers, two poles, right? And so some numbers are going to be plus plus. Other numbers are going to be minus plus. Other numbers are going to be plus minus. Other numbers are going to be minus minus, right? And they're all going to be in the range of, of zero to one. So this will basically create something that looks like this, okay? And then once I create them randomly, I have to assign the label that makes it the two groups. Do you see what I'm saying? So what are the two groups here? Let's see if you can tell me. There's two classes, right? Yeah? The zeros and the x's. So what do the zeros have in common? Hmm? Zero. No, I, the signs, yes, the signs, right? So the zeros, what do they have in common? This is a zero, right? Positives, oops. And which other one is zero? This one, right? And what about these two? They're ones, the other class. They have in common that they're either, uh, negative and positive or negative and positive 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 negative negative do you guys see that huh yeah so we have to do this right so initially i'm going to generate this data as x and then based on that i'm going to generate y okay and then we'll plot it and we'll see that it actually does work any questions on that no nope. pretty easy all right, so now let's go ahead and generate that data. So now that you understand the basic idea, so we can go to the, uh, share the screen, go to the code. We're back here, right? So to generate the data, we're gonna use X, remember, uppercase X, and we can say np.random, And dot uniform uniform. And it's going to be low, low equal minus one, comma. And high equal one, comma, and the size we're going to specify to be two hundred rows and two columns. Okay, so all the numbers are going to follow a specific distribution. They're going to be negative, positive. Uh, they're going to be 
probably pretty small decimal type, right? Um, I would assume there is a function, there is a command I can't remember right now in uh, NumPy where you can tell it to not show scientific notation, but the other one, if you guys can think of it or find it, let me know. But I think it by default, it shows scientific notation. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this one. All right, so the data is generated. And then if I printed X, there's my data. Do you guys see? Make sense? Any questions on this? So you can see some are negatives. So this is like positive, positive. So that would be on the quadrant, like the top quadrant. You have a negative, positive. That's another quadrant and so on. Questions? If you, if you just run it sometimes, sometimes it'll be scientific, they'll find the link. Really? Huh. That's interesting. When you generate eggs in the next shape, and then the egg, yeah, sometimes yeah, they have a Oh, yeah. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is. I did not know that. That's actually a good observation. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting. Huh. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah. So you've got the numbers there. So we've got them now. We can plot them, right? So that's kind of the idea. All right, so we've got our data. Now, this is the next data. You know it's got 200. It's 200 by 2. So what is the interpretation of that in terms of machine learning? 200 by 2 for x? Huh? No. Two features. And then what, what else? 200 samples. Very good. That's X, all right. So what do we need now? We need Y, correct? So for Y, you also need to provide uh, an interpretation, right? So what does the Y vector need to look like exactly? What does the Y vector need to look like? 201, so remember the shapes. I'm all about the shapes, this is, you can you can uh, you can attend the most complicated talk on whatever topic. What are the shapes of your x and y? And they gotta tell you this. If they don't. <laughs> something's going on. All right, very important. So yeah, so y should be one hundred by one in this case. The label, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, two hundred by one, and there's gonna be. Um, that we need the classes, but for now we're gonna do the classes, uh, but let's you, we can use Y lowercase, and then we can do uh, NP dot ones. So we're just gonna initialize the whole vector to ones, and then we're gonna set to zero the values that meet the condition and leave the other ones as one, All right? That should be an easy solution. So I'm gonna do NP ones over here, and it's gotta be the length of X basically. So we can just do length of X or you can hard code it, but it's probably not a good idea to hard code this, right? Because you want, once you change your code, you start changing a lot of things. Run this one. So this should be all, all ones. There you go, all ones. All right, so here comes a, a, a bit of a trick. Uh, how to make the Y represent the XOR data, right? So let's see if you guys can tell me, how do I how do I convert the Y in a very easy way uh, so that for the things that meet the, the criteria of one class, it's zero. And then for the ones that meet the other criteria is one. So zero or one, do you know what I mean? So if we go, let, let me maybe, I didn't word that correctly, but let, let's look here at the whiteboard. So we want something like this, right? How do we do it? If we take, let's call this A and B, right? You guys see this, A and B? So A times B, positive, right? And it's this category, zeros. Minus and minus is this category, and minus times minus is what? Positive. So both of these are positive, correct? So when they are positive, it's one class. How about on the other one? 
minus positive, positive minus. Minus times positive, minus, right? Yes? Negative. So that way we can just write that. So because you already know how to do slicing in NumPy, you don't have to write a, a massive for loop to do this, right? Hopefully we can just do it in one line with NumPy. Okay, so we're gonna do this one. Uh, this is where uh, all those skills come very useful, right? And we're gonna set all of the values to zero because, you know, and then leave the other ones as one, right? So we're just gonna do the logic. So then what do we need to do? We basically say that, We are going to say so we can evaluate a Boolean expression in arrays, and it's going to basically give us give us the indices that meet that condition. Do you see what I'm saying? Like if I have 200 indices, right, in the y vector. I'm going to it within those square brackets, I'm going to evaluate a Boolean of some kind, and the let's say 53 match the Boolean, then it's going to return the indices of those 53. So now I have the 53 indices, and now I have Y for those 53 indices, and I can apply some value. Do you guys see that? So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go ahead and do X, right, times X, uppercase X is less than zero. You see, that's where the Boolean is. So you're evaluating what values of X when multiplied together are negative. So that's gonna be the plus minus or the minus plus, right? Those two, when they get multiplied, they give you something like this. So now, obviously they're coming from X, right? So now we just need to grab them from X. So what do we do? We know that X has rows and columns, right? So we're gonna do comma for the zero column and comma for the one column. Do you guys, do you guys see that? And then here we just grab all. So we do it for all. This is a trick. I don't expect you to have known this, okay? This is kind of a nice trick that with practice, I'm going to do this twice in this script. You know, just know about it. Study it, learn it. Eventually it'll, it'll click in your head and you can do things like this very efficiently. Or at least find the solution and understand what they're doing, which is also a good approach. Do you guys understand what's happening here? So we're comparing column one to column two because that's zero and one. And we're saying for all the rows, right? Compare them. But basically, no, sorry, multiply them. The result of that is it less than zero. If it is, one of them had to have been positive, the other one had to have been negative or negative and positive. Yeah? And that's basically what we do. So now I do this for Y, I'm gonna run it. Okay, let's run. Now I'm gonna print Y. And as you can see now, some are ones, some are zeros. And then I've marked the ones that are, you know, like we were trying to do. Any questions on this part, guys? Did this make sense? Yeah? All right, great. So now let's print the shapes, just so be, I'm gonna save it, print the shapes. So I'm gonna do, print x dot shape okay I'm gonna do print y dot shape so it's always important to kind of have this sense right so you have 200 by two that's the x and 200 uh, labels now the nice thing about this is let's view it we want to now view. So the thing that I drew by hand on the whiteboard, now let's view it, but with matplotlib, right? So we can totally do that, right? So this is probably, you know, this is one thing in 265 and, and also the visualization class, if you do take it, 
you know, these are the kinds of things that would stress. I'm not, I'm just kind of throwing matplotlib, you know, at you, but you'll see the value of it really quickly. All right, so the kind of how, how this works is you always make a call to PLT, right? That's from matplotlib. And you can do things like histogram like that. You can do plot, right? Or in my case right now, I'm going to do a scatter plot. I think when you do plot, it tries to create a line and connects the points. Whereas when you do scatter, it just throws the points in there. So I'm doing scatter. So I'm going to do two scatters um, for the different labels. So I'm going to do PLT dot scatter just like that and then usually at the end of that you do plt dot show now matplotlib is very powerful i mean i can't even like scratch the surface on this there's so much so many other things that you can do with it okay uh but we just want to visualize right now what we have so really what you provide in a scatter is like the x-axis and the y-axis data so remember, we're drawing a two-dimensional thing. So like the coordinate on the X, coordinate on the Y, and then it's going to draw a little point on the screen. But we can also specify uh, the size of it. So size 50, we can specify the color. So we got to do this color coded. So I'm going to pick here light green, and it's got a lot of uh, options. The marker. Has several markers. So I think for this one, it'll be square. So marker S, I think, is for square. And then you can also um, label these if you were using a, a legend. So you'd have to, in the plt.show, you'd have to do plt.legend and print out the legend. So you can specify that. So label equal. <laughs> class zero. It's not relevant for this one, so I'm not going to do it. But... You guys see that? Does this make sense? All right. And then for the second one, again, I, I the X and Y, they're still incomplete because those require a little bit more, but I'm doing the easier parts first. Okay. So again, we're going to specify the size. So 50. And then I'm going to specify, obviously, a different color here. And you can pick any colors you want. Pick orange. Should be. I think my battery is low. Yeah, just give me a second. We'll, we'll finish with this and then finish up the neural network part. Thursday. But at least you'll have the data. Okay. All right. So um, we were doing the color, right? So orange. And then uh, the marker here. So let's pick. Uh, o, like oval, maybe. And let's do label. And the label here should be class one. All right. So that's... All right, so now that was kind of the easy part. Now what we have to figure out is this part, the X's and the Y's. And we're gonna do a trick similar to the previous one, kind of slice the data, right? So we need the data from X, column one and column two. Column one goes on this axis, column Y goes on the other axis, right? So basically these two come from X. So basically X, and X, you see that? And this is, of course, coming from X. Notice the uppercase. Yes? 
X has two columns. So it's gonna be the zero and the one. So that, but there's an, so there's like this, right? And then here we just specify zero and here we just specify one. Do you understand? So that's just column zero, column one of X so that we can plot this data. All right, and then we can do the same for this bottom one. Zero, comma there. This one's gonna be comma one. Now, the key question is that we need to once again, select just the indices that match a Boolean condition. In this case, what's the Boolean? On the Y, right? So on the Y, we want to look at the Boolean here. So here, oops, sorry, this should be lowercase, Y, right? I'm gonna focus on this one here, Y, right? And equal, oops, sorry. All right, so what goes there? Zero, right? Zero, because these are the samples in this color, in this color, or a light green, we only show the X's that belong to class zero, because we want to show those in orange. We already kind of did the assignment of the label, right? So this is zero. And then this is zero. Do you see that? And then we repeat the same exercise at the bottom. Remember that a Boolean in a, in a NumPy array returns the indices that match that Boolean, right? So here we do Y equal, Y equal. What about for this one? In, in uh, what's the color? In uh, orange, we're gonna plot the points that are of the other class, right? So what's the value here? One, right? One. Make sense? And that's it. All right, so let's go ahead and, and run that one. I'm gonna save it. Your XOR data. Any questions? Do you see how no straight line, right? We'll separate it. We need a, a neural network that can separate it like that. That and then like that. But we have that's the XOR data basically. Ready for uh, the machine learning part. So let's do, yeah, so let's do just the last part, uh, separate that because we have a few minutes, separate the data into train test, right? And then we're going to finish up the second part on Thursday, where we're going to implement in TensorFlow a linear model, which is going to be logistic regression, and then a deep neural network. And then after that, you guys can play with different architectures and but pretty much, uh, you know, a neural network should be able to solve it, like a simple one, like a multi-layer perceptron. Got it, guys? All right, so let's do the last part. So I plotted the data. You can visualize it. You know how it has gotten. We created it from scratch, literally. We didn't have to read some obscure, um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, text file, All right? So we're going to need an X train. We're gonna need an X, a Y train, right? And we're gonna need an X test. Oops, this should be an underscore. We're gonna need an X test and we need a Y test. So we're going to train our model with X train, Y train, and then we're going to evaluate performance on X test, Y test. And as I said, now we're going to focus on, we're going to build this with Keras. 
as much as possible in this class. We're going to use Keras uh, from TensorFlow. And basically, we're going to prove that only neural networks can, uh, can solve the XOR problem. OK, so just, you know, again, we slice the data. So for, all right, so you guys slice it here. And, and I'll tell you, half of them for train, half of them for test. So how do you slice it? Let's see. How do you write the slicing for train and test? Yeah, so we're not gonna randomize it. Let's just take the first hundred. What about here? What do we select here? Both, Both right, or all, right, good. So, and then for Y, we're gonna, from Y, then it has to match exactly. Now you could have picked these randomly. You could use sklearn or, or something like that. 100, right? Same thing. So that means, okay, so now that you saw that one, for the bottom one, how do you write it? 100 colon, and then here, colon, right? Um, this one, 100 colon. That's it. That's just something easy. We don't even need 70, 30% split. It'd be interesting to know with how many it learns, right? That'd be a good, um, you know, do we just give it 10%? But anyway, let's run this one. I think it's almost time. So let me do run. All right. And I think this is a good stopping point. What we have left then to do on Thursday is we'll go over a little bit of the theory, a little bit of history of neural nets. So as I said, it's a fun one. And then um, we'll do logistic regression on neural net. And then I'll, I'll let you guys try different architectures, basically. That's it. All right. So... Believe it or not, this is going to be a pretty complete neural network. And then as long as you, you can take your data to this point, you can solve many things. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll stop the recording at this point. Save this section. So I'll end it.